I'm here to introduce you to a family, the Salinas family. Uh, George and Marissa were preparing to enter the missionary field. Uh, they were in our church. We were really excited about their, their journey. And a few uh, months after this photo was taken, George was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. This is a heinous disease. It's a disease that's um, very difficult to fight in the clinic. It's one that um, all of us were fearful for, for him uh, in that period of time when there's all this doubt. But George really dove into the challenge. He fought that cancer with his oncologist. They used every tool in their back to fight the cancer. George actually traveled to another part of the country to get access to a really promising type of chemotherapy. And it extended his life. But ultimately, he passed away about 18 months after the diagnosis. Now, I'm here actually to celebrate George's battle because he taught all of us. If you knew him, if you watched him go through this battle, he taught me and he taught my family, if you focus on the end and you really drive yourself through that process, you can end well. You can finish the, the race very well. Uh, if you think about the battle of cancer, the battle is one that's very challenging right now. We're in the best of scenarios applying basically chemotherapy to fight all the, the, the diseases that are in the cancer field. Effectively, we're giving drugs to patients in the hope that the cancer cells that grow faster than the other cells will be diminished. And as a result, we're, we're basically carpet bombing our patients. What we need to do is we need to change the game. We need to change the game towards a targeted therapy, towards a precision-based medicine. Right now, if you give a drug to a population of folks, let's say this group of people who all have colon cancer or pancreatic cancer, if you give them drugs effectively, some portion of those people will actually have an adverse drug reaction. They get worse. That's terrible. Other folks you give the drug to, they don't get any better. That's just as terrible. And there's only a small population of people that actually see net benefit. Ultimately, around 30% of all cancer patients see some improvement as a result of all these efforts. That's terrible. We've got to change this game. The way we change this game is by improving our knowledge of the biology of cancer. Cancer is effectively a disease of the DNA. So everybody's probably seen an image like this. This double helix is effectively a representation of our DNA. I think of it as a ladder, right? And to give you a sense of the magnitude here, you look at a little twisted ladder, each one of those rungs on that ladder, that represents a base pair. So imagine three billion of those base pairs. That's a ladder that stretches from here all the way to Mars. <laughs> Big ladder. Very, dif very difficult to get our hands around the exact pattern of that DNA. There's about 25,000 genes in all human beings. And a normal person has a certain pattern, a certain sequence, if you will, along the rungs of that ladder. The really neat part about this process, though, is that we actually now have tools that allow us to sequence the entire human genome. It took $4 billion for our government and our world, effectively, to figure out how to do it the first time. And we did that for the first time in 2003. That was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we invested $4 billion, and the first patient in line had to pay $300 million to get it done. 10 years later, it's less than $10,000. Now think about that. You've all heard of Moore's Law, right? The speed at which the computer industry is getting faster and faster and the cost of computing is falling off. Look at this graphic here. Look at the red line. That's the cost of sequencing. Now that's the really exciting part here in the, in the George Salinas story. The, the patients that are fighting cancer today are seeing more and more tools come to bear every single day in the clinic. So the question is, when the cost of the whole human genome gets down to $1,000 or less, what are we going to do with all the information? Unfortunately, right now you might get a $1,000 genome, but you're going to have a $50,000 report to try to figure all that data out. So by design, what we've said is, we want to focus in. You've got to jump on that train somewhere and wrestle, wrestle this problem to the ground. And so what we've done is we said, all right, there are other centers, academic centers all over the world, that are sequencing the entire genome. But by design, we want to focus on a little different process. Let's focus in on the specific genes that are thought to be clinically relevant today. So let's do a little quick time, uh, a little time travel. Everybody sees this photo, you probably remember, some of us even saw this occur. A room full of computers to achieve basically what can be achieved in a very small footprint today. So let's think about that, 1950. All right, now let's fast forward 30 years. This computer was the first computer I saw <laughs> when I was at NC State studying uh, chemical engineering. I didn't have a computer at home. Most of us didn't, or of my age. But this was a really powerful tool. It could do everything that that whole room full of machinery could do. But it was all in one little spot. Now, the problem with the machine is I had to go to it. <laughs> I had to use little floppy drives. You all remember those? <laughs> now, let's fast forward 30 years to today, right? Everybody pick up that thing that we were carrying around. Who's got one? Anybody? Smartphone? This is vastly more powerful. And, and in a year, this thing's going to be a piece of garbage because it's going faster and faster. And that's a blessing. That's incredible. That's power. 
And we want to harness that power in the fight against cancer with focus. So this picture right here shows you a hero in the battle against cancer, Dr. Joe Stevenson, the medical director with ITOR here in town. This is the first guy that I met that said, you know what, if we could get our hands on the genetics of that person's cancer, we could change how we fight this, this battle. And he's the one that convinced us, let's find a way to get one of these sequencing machines into our, into our facility. Let's harness it, and we'll tell you what you need to do. We just need you to do it. Well, as an entrepreneur, I said, I think we could do that. And that machine that you see there, that was 10 years after the advent when there was a room full of machinery to achieve the same thing that this can do on the bench top, right? This is called a next generation sequencing machine. And the, the process of improvement, the power and the capabilities of these machines over the next 10 years from now, imagine. Think about the transition from that Apple computer to the smartphone that's in your hand. That's the, that's the tiger we're riding right now. We've got it by the tail. Now, how are we gonna translate that to something meaningful? We work with folks that have the ability to change outcomes for patients. Right here in our community, we're blessed with this entity called ITOR. ITOR is the Institute for Translational Oncology Research. They're a part of the Greenville Health System. You saw the logos outside. The most important thing I'd like to communicate to you today is these folks are in the battle. They're fighting this battle every day. They've been bringing the chemotherapies and the other types of drugs out to, to, to do the carpet bombing, but they've been agonizing for these focused, precision-based tools. And they built a center that we're enabling today to focus on three key areas. Number one, bring clinical trials, phase one clinical trials that are targeted and bring them to, a, to the community-based setting. Number two, profile the patients that are there so that we can treat them differently today, but also learn things from as we move forward. So if you treat somebody based on a genetic fingerprint today and they respond favorably, that confirms your expectation. If some patients don't respond favorably and then you look at the genetic fingerprint that they have, you can start to learn why. It's really amazing. The power of this technology in these people's hands is gonna change the game for cancer, not only in our community, but all over the country and all over the world. The last part about this, though, is that they've also built a biorepository. So when you come and your cancer is removed and they store that, that tissue sample, we sequence it. If we find new things, we can go back and pull that tissue from the bank. So the process here doesn't require you have to come back and be biopsied again. Those three elements are critical elements in there, that the, the, if you will, the milestones that are necessary for building these centers all across the nation. Now, remember I mentioned to you there's 3 billion base pairs, 25,000 genes, there's lots of information. How are we going to focus? What we're doing is we're narrowing down to what are called oncogenes. These are genes that have been known to have some relation to cancer, but there's not been definitive proof in many cases that there is actually something that you can act against. So what we did was we sat down with the doctors and said, okay, of those genes for colon cancer patients, there's certain genes there with the gold stars that fundamentally will change what a doctor can do if we can just get them that data. It's a travesty that people are being treated today in cancer centers all over the country without their doctors knowing this information. Their particular cancer, the mutations in those genes can guide specific use of drugs that could be targeted instead of the carpet bombing event. Right? That's amazing. We should be doing that every day. There should be no cancer patient in this country that tolerates treatment without this information. Let's change that game. Let's get this news out there. These genes are the ones that are important today. But we've got to learn because there's all those other genes that we're going to be looking at for the same cost. And we're going to be able to change and learn and grow as the machines get more powerful. We get more people enrolling and we learn more and more about this technology and about these genes. We're going to save lives. We're going to extend lives. And that's the passion that we want to employ in the community setting every day of the week. Now, if we get this information for each of these patients, guess what we can do? Instead of giving everybody the same drug, we can actually use precision medicine. We can use personalized medicine. We can give a subset of people based on their genetic fingerprint or their molecular profile. We can give them one drug. Another group with a different profile, same colon cancer, same pan 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 pancreatic cancer, whatever, we give them a second drug. And the really neat part here is combination drug therapy has already been proven to whip another disease. That same time frame in the 80s, you guys may remember when the, the advent of AIDS, right? When I was working on that Apple computer, I heard about the scourge disease and it was a death sentence. You don't hear about deaths from AIDS in the, in the developed world nowadays. What you hear about is HIV infections. And the reason that occurred, the reason that that condition and an HIV infection translated from a death sentence to a chronic condition is we learned to take the genetics of the virus, of the HIV virus, and target drugs against it. And guess what? That virus is insidious, and so it changes. Then we put another drug in its way. But then we learned if we put lots of drugs in its way, it just dies. It, it shrinks. It goes to a very small viral load. 
Now, it's terrible to have an HIV infection, but you can live for a very long time because we've employed the same concept in the battle against that terrible disease. And we're on the advent of doing it against cancer if we all work together. So let's think about other cancers. Here, uh, melanoma. This is what our doctors think is the profile, the specific genes they should be looking at on every melanoma patient that comes into the clinic. But as we do our work over the next year, we're going to see other genes that start to pop out. Now, you notice these other genes, if you look at the, the graphic there, they're, they're not gold, right? That's because you've got to have a statistically relevant number of people to confirm that that outcome was based on the specific genetic pattern that they're looking at. So how are we going to get there? We get there by expanding this, not just in the academic centers, which are excellent. We're collaborating with Fox Chase and MD Anderson and places like that all over the country. But what we really can focus on is getting this down to the community-based level where every patient gets screened. Now let's think about that. Just in our community, 100 miles from where we're standing, sitting today, there's 6 million people. Now that's a lot of people. Imagine if we do cancer profiling for all those people and we start gaining that learning opportunity, right? The problem though is it's <laughs> a ladder that stretches to Mars, right? And we got to get enough people to do it. We got to get enough power on it that we can combine our efforts and ultimately change this, this, this gestalt, right? It's like looking for needles in a haystack, right? So what the folks at ITOR want me to tell you today, what our team wants to convey to you today is even if we do everything we can in our local community, what we need to do is we need to add other people in the search for the needles in this haystack. We want to grow this across the United States. And we want to focus on partnering with other centers that already have those three elements, the biorepository, the molecular profiling, and this phase one capability. But also with the community centers that have the patients who don't have access to those things. Let's get them to partner with us and send their patient data to us. And as, as we grow this thing, we'll start to find those needles. We'll start to improve our knowledge, and we'll get even better at guiding the particular drugs to fight that person's cancer. I just want to end this with the, uh, the, the reflection that there are families just like the Salinas family all over our country. They're in our communities. They're in our churches. They may be, in our, you know, they may be our family that's fighting this disease. If we do our job, if you guys help us get this word out, if we have every patient profiled that has a solid tumor in the next two to three years, imagine where we can be. Imagine what the next smartphone equivalent is going to be in the next generation sequencing field. Let's fight this battle, and let's fight it for the Salinas families all over.